So far, we've seen how to use the Lagrangian formulation to solve uh, some systems that we've seen previously, like pendulums and uh, masses on springs. But in this video, I wanted to show you how we can approach problems that we haven't seen before. Um, so I'm going to work through a more complicated example, and I'll show you the steps the general steps that you would use to approach a physics problem with the Lagrangian. So the example that I'm going to work is a double pendulum. And so that's basically, you have one pendulum hanging from the ceiling, M1, length one, and then you have some other mass M2, length two, hanging from the first pendulum. And so I'll put some links in the description that show, uh, so you can see some demonstrations for the motion of a double pendulum. Okay, so this is the system that we're gonna be looking at. And if I draw it, in a slightly different way, we'll see that we can we'll have another parameter theta with respect to each each string that the mass is attached to. And so uh, as with any time we're dealing with these pendulums, uh, we assume that the string doesn't compress or uh, stretch and that it's rigid just to make our lives easier. Okay, so this is our system. So now the general steps that we want to follow for um, solving Lagrangians so the first thing you want to do is to write down your position of whatever mass you're interested in Then step two, uh, you take the, deriv the time derivative of that. And that would give you your velocity. And then with the velocity, you can write your your kinetic energy. And then you can also, with your position, usually, you can write down your potential energy. Then, uh, depending on the forms of those equations, you might want to um, recast your variables. And I'll show you what I mean by that in this, uh, this problem that I'm about to work. And then for part six, you can write down your Euler-Lagrange equation for the equations of motion. Okay, so for this problem, we'll look at one mass at a time. So if this is theta one, m one, and then 
M2, theta2. The x position for mass 1 is, so we've got this this triangle, theta 1, and we know L1, and we want the x and the y components. So from this uh, triangle, we see that opposite over hypotenuse, so sine theta 1 equals x over L1, so L1 is x so x is l1 sine theta 1 and then y will be l l1 cosine theta 1 and we can check this uh, that we have the right trig function. So if we set theta one equal to zero, then the pendulum would be just straight down and we would expect no, um, no x component. So sine of zero is zero. And so this checks out, okay? So now if we do the time derivative, so x dot, which is d by dt of x, the l is a constant, so that's not going to change. The derivative of sine is cosine, and then the time derivative of theta is theta dot, and now the y dot dy by dt l1 negative l1 sine theta 1 theta 1 dot okay now we can write the kinetic energy of mass 1 will be one half m1 times x dot squared plus y dot squared. I guess I should have labeled these y's x's with one subscripts. Okay, so plugging in what we found for x dot and y dot, we get L1 squared, uh, so x was cosine squared theta 1, theta 1 dot squared, and then plus, uh, so this is negative, but when you square it, the negative goes away. L1 squared sine squared theta, theta one dot squared. Okay, so both terms have an L1 squared and a theta one dot squared, so we can factor those out. And we're left with sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta, which from our trig identities we know is just one. So we're left with one half m1 l1 squared theta one dot squared. So there's, and this is t1. So there's the kinetic energy for mass one. Now the so if we draw our picture again, uh, 
and I'm just going to draw mass one uh, for a second. So comparing the, I guess that's not a good drawing. So comparing the height between these uh, two positions and doing some trig, you'll see that the height is L minus L and then Let's see. So I'm going to guess cosine theta. And so when theta is zero, then the height should be zero. So cosine zero is one, you get L minus L, which is zero. So that is the correct trig function. Okay. And then you can simplify that to be L times one minus cosine theta one. And then the potential energy for mass one is M one G H, which is M one G L one times one minus cosine theta one. So if we were just doing a single pendulum then we would have our kinetic energy and our potential energy. We would subtract those to get the Lagrangian. And then we would uh, take a series of partial and total derivatives to get the Euler Lagrange equations. But our problem is more complicated than that. So we found the kinetic and potential energy for mass one. But now what about for mass two? So if you look from the position of mass one, all of the trig and stuff we were doing uh, to find X and Y, uh, that would be the same if you're measuring from the position of M1. But M2 is at the those coordinates plus whatever coordinates M1 are at. So basically the X position will be for mass two will be a superposition of the uh, location of M1 plus the location of M2. And so this looks, so the position of, of mass one in the X position, we saw that that was um, all the way back here, L one sine theta one. And then the position of mass two from mass one will be L2 sine theta two. And then for Y, we'll get the same thing with cosines. Okay, so those are the positions. Now we can take time derivatives, so X dot. Time derivative of this we've already seen. And then the second term will be the same, just replacing the subscripts one with the subscripts two. And then we've seen y as well. I'll just put a negative sign out in front. And then it's L one sine theta one, theta one dot plus L two sine theta two, theta two dot. Okay. Now, if we 
we plug that into, so T2 is, oh, let's put, okay, X2 subscripts there, X2 dot plus Y2 dot <clears throat> one half M2. And so let's do this in piecemeal because there's going to be a lot of terms because we have to square these derivatives. So x1 dot squared is, or x2 dot squared is L1 cosine theta 1, theta 1 dot plus L2 cosine theta 2, theta 2 dot squared, or not squared yet. So then we have to square this term, so we have to FOIL, so we'll get two, or not a two here, L1 squared cosine squared theta one, theta one dot squared plus L2 cosine squared theta two, theta two dot squared. And then we have the cross term, two L1 cosine theta one, theta one dot and then cosine theta two theta two dot all right then we do the same thing for y so there is this negative sign out in front, negative one out in front basically, but when we square that, it'll just go away, which is nice. And then we've got our L1 sine theta one, theta one dot plus L2 sine theta two, theta two dot squared. So the negative sign out in front goes away and we get something similar uh, to the X direction except all of our sines are cosines. So you'll notice that just like we had in the, uh, if we were just doing a single pendulum, there's the cosine squared terms and there's the sine squared terms. Maybe I'll do them in different colors. So these red terms will match up and the sine squared plus cosine squared will go to one. And then these blue terms will also have a sine squared plus cosine squared that will go to one. And so what's left in the orange are these two terms and we're going to use a, a trig function to simplify them. Okay. So let's start doing that. So we're plugging this all into this one half m2 x2 dot squared plus y2 dot squared. So we've got this L1 squared theta. I 
and one half and two, and then inside there's this L1 squared theta one dot squared term, and then the sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta one. And then there's an L2 squared theta two dot squared times sine squared theta one plus or theta two plus cosine squared theta two. And we know that these just go to one. And now there's from these two terms, we see that there's an L1, an L2, a theta one dot and a theta two dot in both of the terms. So we're gonna factor those out. L1, L2, theta one, theta two. And what we're left with is sine theta one, sine theta two plus cosine theta one cosine theta two. Now, I'm not very good at remembering trig uh, identities. So this could be something you haven't seen in a while, but this trig identity is equal to cosine of theta one minus theta two. So we can simplify this a bit and arrive at our final equation for the kinetic energy of mass two. These dots. Okay, so we're almost done with the setup. So we've gotten our kinetic energy for mass one, our potential energy for mass one, and now we've gotten our kinetic energy for mass two. So the last step will be getting the potential energy for mass two. And so just like we had with the um, So we've already seen the y positions um, for mass two uh, back here. And we saw how the height was related to the y position for the single pendulum. So the y position is L1 cosine theta and the height is L1 minus the Y position. And so we can do a similar thing for mass two, only now, so if we wanted the height from the straight down position, so this would be, I'm gonna draw it in red. So the straight down position of M2 would be L1 plus L2. And then you would have to subtract the, so the height would be L1 plus L2. And then you have to subtract the height of mass one, which is L1's uh, cosine theta. And then you have to subtract the height of, or the, yeah, the Y position of mass two. And so you can group these together
So this would be L1 times one minus cosine theta one minus L2 times one minus cosine theta two. And so again, you can check this. So if theta one and theta two are both zero, then you would expect the pendulum to be straight up and down. So one minus uh, cosine of zero is, uh, so cosine of zero is one. So one minus one is zero. Oh, and then this terms plus. And then one minus cosine of zero. So cosine of zero is one again. Uh, so this would be zero. And so your total height would be zero. But you can imagine orientations where, for example, the, I'll draw it in blue, the mass one pendulum could be straight down, but the mass two pendulum could be at some height. And so it has to be a superposition of these two heights. So all that to get our height for our mass two. And so our potential energy for mass two is M two G H two, which is M two G times L one times one minus cosine theta one plus L two times one minus cosine theta two. Okay, so now we have all of the kinetic energies, all the potential energies. So now we can finally write down our Lagrangian T1 minus, or T1 plus T2 minus V1 plus V2. All right, so this is gonna be a lot of writing. So T1, we found here, one half M1 L1 squared theta one dot squared. So one half M1 L1 theta one dot squared. And then for mass two, uh, we had a, the same term. And then a term for mass two. And then we had that ugly cross term L1, L2, theta one dot, theta two dot, cosine theta one minus theta two. So those are all of our kinetic energies. And then our potential energy or mass one was MGL one times one minus cosine theta one. And this minus L. And then M there's the same term for the height of the pendulum one, and then you have the height for pendulum two. Okay, so this is a lot, and now we need to 
start taking time derivatives or taking partial derivatives of this. So the first partial derivative we'll take is with respect to theta one dot. And so before I move on, so this Lagrangian is a function of theta one dot, theta two dot, theta one and theta two. So because there's uh, two separate um, variables, because there's two masses in our system, then we're going to be able to find two separate um, equations of motion for those uh, two masses. And so just like our Euler-Lagrange, when we had one mass looked like this, Now we just are going to do that twice, where we have a theta 1, and then we have 1 for theta 2. OK. And so we're going to start with the, uh, the derivatives with respect to theta one dot and theta one. So taking the derivatives with respect to theta one dot, maybe I'll color code these equations. So in red is our Euler-Lagrange equation for Theta one. So if we look, oops, theta one. So if we look at our Lagrangian, that has a theta one, that has a theta one, and actually we could just combine these two terms. This has a theta one dot. Okay, so there's three, or really two terms that have a theta one dot, and then if we look at And then if we look at theta one, there's one, two, three terms that have the theta one dot, or just theta one. And then if we look in blue for the Euler Lagrange for theta twos, got one, two, so two terms that have theta two dot, and then one, two terms that have theta two. Okay, and I guess before I, I start doing this, I'm going to simplify my Lagrangian a bit. Uh, so first we can combine these terms. So this is just M1 L1 theta one dot squared. And then everything else will stay the same.
and then our for our potential energies, we can factor out this mg m2g term. So I guess you could factor out all of the g's, uh, but then there there might be too many parentheses for me to keep track of. So so this minus m1g L1 times one minus cosine theta one minus. Hmm. So let's think about this. Do we want to, because we could factor out a one minus cosine theta one term. Yeah, I think that's what I'll do instead of factoring out the M2G term. So I'm going to, So we've got this M1G L1 and M2G L1 times one minus cosine theta one. So that's one minus cosine theta one times M1G L1 plus M two G L one plus M two G L two one times one minus cosine theta two. Okay, so that's a little bit simplified. So now if we do our partial derivative with respect to theta one, we've got two M one L one theta one dot plus, so now the second term has a theta one dot. So L one L two theta two dot cosine of theta one minus theta two. Now if we take the time derivative of this, and it's a total time derivative, so it's gonna get messy. So the first two terms are easy. or I guess the first term is easy, but then the second term, so let's pull out the two things that are constant, and then we'll have theta two double dot cosine theta one minus theta two, and then plus now, so theta two dot the Derivative of cosine is sine, negative sine. So let's make this a negative. Sine of theta one minus theta two. And then we would have to take the derivative of the term inside and that would look like theta one dot minus theta two dot. Okay, then we've got to do the derivative with respect to theta one So there's this cosine theta one term. So L1, L2, one dot, two dot. And then again, it'll be negative and it'll become sine theta one minus theta two. And then the derivative of inside is just one. And then we've got this 
lovely one minus cosine term, cosine theta one term. And so it's going to be distributed to both of these terms. So if you did the FOIL method here, the first term has no um, no theta one term. The outside has no theta one term. So it's just the inside and the last terms that have the, the theta one term. And so let me make sure I'm keeping track of my negative signs well. So this whole thing has a negative sign out in front because of the negative sign in front of the potential. Then this got another negative sign because we took the derivative of cosine. Now, this will be cosine theta one times m1 g l1. The derivative of cosine is negative sine but it already has a negative sign out in front. So that'll be positive M1 G L1 sine theta one. And then the last term will look the same, but it'll be M2 G L1 sine theta one. Okay. So now we can combine all of this into an Euler-Lagrange equation. And it'll look messy at first, but it'll simplify a bit as we go. So when we were writing down our Lagrangian, I accidentally wrote an M1 where there should be an M2. And so in here, this term is should be a M1 plus M2 term. And then here, this should be M1 plus M2. Okay, so now we've got all of our time derivatives correct or all of our partial derivatives and then our one time derivative. And now we can write down our Euler-Lagrange equation in all of its glory, which is this L1 theta one double dot plus M two over two L1, L2, the two double dot but times cosine of theta one minus theta two, and then we have the other term because we had to take the derivative of the cosine which becomes sine and then the derivative of inside theta one dot minus theta two dot. Okay so that's the left hand side of the equation and then the right hand side of the equation is this lovely thing L1, L2, theta one dot, theta two dot, sine of theta one minus theta two minus MGL, sine of theta one minus M two G L two well, no, still L1. And 
and then sine theta one. Okay, so this is our Euler-Lagrange equation, and it's a bit messy, but some of the things to notice is that, so just like for a single pendulum, there's still this theta one double dot term, but now that angular acceleration depends on the angular acceleration of mass two, the angular velocity of mass two, and even the uh, linear or even the angular velocity of mass one, in addition, of course, to the position of mass one. So now that we have this, let's write down the partial derivatives for theta two. And so looking at our Lagrangian, for theta two, we only had one, two terms. And so when we do that partial derivative, we get these two terms. Now we have to take the total time derivative of that. And we get m2 l2 theta two double dot plus one half m2 l1 l2 and then we'll have to do the same thing we did previously so theta one double dot cosine theta one minus theta two then add the derivative of the second which derivative of cosine is negative sine so that'll get a minus sign and then sine theta one minus theta two. And then you have to do the derivative inside. So theta one dot theta two minus ah, minus theta two dot. All right. And then taking the partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to theta two. So for that, there were, there's one, two terms that have a theta two in them. So the first term is this one half term and then the derivative of cosine will just be negative sine. So we'll get one half m2, is it m2? Yeah. L1, L2, theta one dot, theta two dot. And then that'll become negative because of the sine of theta one minus theta two. Uh, but then I guess the derivative inside would be a negative one, so that would just become positive again. And then there's one more term that has a theta two. And so that's m2 g l2 cosine times negative cosine, so that'll be a positive again. So m2 g l2 sine theta two. And so you see this is a bit less complicated than the Euler-Lagrange for theta one. M2 L2 theta two double dot plus one half M2 L1 L2 theta one double dot cosine theta one minus theta two minus theta one dot sine theta one minus theta two times theta one minus theta two dot.
And then that has to equal one half M two L one two one dot two dot sine theta one minus theta two plus M two G L two sine theta two. Okay, so just like we saw for mass one, so we get the expected uh, angular velocity or angular acceleration. And we also, just like we had with mass one, we have that the position of mass two is going to depend on the angular velocity of mass one. But the angular acceleration of mass one, the angular velocity of mass one, but also the angular velocity of itself. So if we look at these two Euler-Lagrange equations next to each other, you'll see that they both have the theta one dot double dot and theta two double dot. So this is a coupled system of, of differential equations. And so there are techniques to solve these types of equations, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this class. So uh, it's enough for this classical mechanics class to say that we've now written down the Euler-Lagrange equations, and we know that there is a mathematical method to solve coupled different equations, but we are not going to do that. So this problem was really just to show you the general procedure for solving uh, Lagrangian mechanics problems. And that's to first uh, write down your positions in terms of the variables given in the problem. Then you take time derivatives of those positions to get velocity. You, with that velocity, you can write down your kinetic energy. And then with the position, you can write down your potential energy. Then you can write, uh, if you need to, you can change those. Uh, like for this example, we had to change our x dot and y dot into theta dots. So we had to recast our variables. And then once you have everything in variables that you like, you can write down your Euler-Lagrange equation to which you could solve to get the equations of motion. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Keep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.